Well, hello and welcome to the KETV YouTube page and to Conversations. You know, there's nothing unusual about a school teacher asking a class to quiet down, but what about a school teacher who asks folks to get loud? Well, that's what we have here today. We have a retired school teacher, a newly retired state senator, and the driving force behind the new nonprofit called Get Loud Arkansas. Our guest is State Senator Joyce Elliott. Senator, welcome back to KET. Oh, I thank you so much. I, I am so happy to be here. Such great circumstances. Absolutely. Always good to be with you. Yeah. I, I want to talk all about Get Loud Arkansas okay. and the goals that you're hoping to accomplish there. But th this week, you spent your final day on the floor of the Arkansas State Senate, where you served for 14 years. What was it like to kind of close that chapter in your life? Actually, it, it was, it was, it was nostalgic in a way, but it was a very good thing. It was not sad. Uh, the, the funniest thing, though, is I had forgotten this was the day that we really get honored, and we were supposed to have something to say, <laughs> and I had not had, I had not thought about it. And when we started, when I saw our uh, President Pro Tem with the plaques, I went, oh my gosh, that means that we are doing something. And I, okay, at least my, I'm number two seniority in the Senate, so I knew it would be a little while so I could think about it, something to say. But um, it, it really did feel like the culmination of a lot of years of commitment to public service uh, in a way that I felt proud of it. Mm. You know, I, I thought, I, I'm, I'm leaving without scandal, <laughs> with my head <laughs> held high, and with the certainty, and you can't be that certain about many things, that I knew um, I had come to just give my dead level best to the state and to the people that I served, and to be certain that I never wavered um, in doing what I thought was the right thing to do for people, mm. and that I listened that some one of the most important things is in the face of a lot of opposition have the courage to stand up and do it anyway um and and i did and and i felt good about that and you know and i have other things i want to do and i it's one of the things i've wanted to do with my life mm -hmm. and i and i never saw politics as this awful thing that you shouldn't do but it was what i wanted to do since i was a kid right wow. um, so um, I, I got to do it, and I recommend it to everybody. But it was, it, I, I felt proud having served in that body because mm -hmm. I think sometimes we forget what a privilege it is that on any given day when we have over 3 million people, there are only 135 of us who get to work in that building to make the policies that, that um, we live by, mm -hmm. good or bad. And so it can be very humbling. But it, it, it felt good to know this is it, and, uh, but, it's, but it's not a, and a, not a bad end at all. It's yeah. a new beginning. It is a privilege, yeah, for sure. Is, yeah. You mentioned working in the face of opposition. I, I think people might forget that when you joined the legislature in 2001 as a member of the House, yes. the, the Democrats were the majority had been forever, mm -hmm. continued to be until about 2012 or so. Right. I, I've talked with a few Democrats who've left the legislature in the last few years, and, and the sense I've gotten for them is that, that they ran into some frustration mm -hmm. with how things operate at the state capitol. They felt like they, they couldn't accomplish the things that they wanted right. to accomplish as mm -hmm. they walked out the door. Did you come to share that frustration? I did, actually, because I, I, there were so many things I thought we could have done that we did not do, mm. or so many things we did that it was not a good idea to do it. And I think people uh, forget, or maybe they don't even know, that when the Democrats were the majority, Democrats were, by and large, a, a, a very moderate group of people. Um, and I can't put my, I can't count myself among the moderates because I've always been very much more progressive, or as uh, John Bromet always says, the the liberal li lioness of the Senate. <laughs> but um, I I I want people to know that it is not an equivalency to to think that when the Democrats were in charge that it was as partisan as it is, and I don't think it would be uh, right now had Republicans not been out of power so long. Because when you get power sometime, you know, you've got things pent up that you want to do. And we have just become more partisan as a nation. Um, so there were things, even when uh, I was a part of the majority party, there were things, because I, I tended to be more uh, progressive, that didn't get done that I wish we could have had done. But here lately, I, I think I'm more bothered by some of the things that we, that we did do because uh, I, we became more and more intrusive into the lives of people, and I, I didn't think that was a good idea. Uh, I, I have under Democrats and Republicans, but um, I think we, we are positioned to be a world-class education state, 
and we just haven't stepped up to the plate. That really concerns me that I was not able to persuade enough people to just like, let, let's, let's not settle for adequate. Mm -hmm. That's what the Constitution says when it was not really a visionary document. Um, because the, the world our young people are growing up in is not the world we are preparing them for, I feel, because it's become a very different place. And, you know, for example, they ought to be learning uh, foreign languages at an early age. Mm -hmm. I wish we, for example, uh, were teaching them about how to be diplomats as opposed to just the military. That's really, really important. That's why we have JROTC. And what I'm trying to get our schools to think about now is let's also write along JROTC Let's have DOTC, which would be Diplomatic Officers Training Corps, um, because our kids are going to need, the young people are going to need both those things. Because right. when you look at what's happening now, we talk about politics being important. Uh, we need to have our young people not putting themselves in a position where we are right now, for example, in the Ukraine and with the United States and all of NATO. Uh, they need to be in a position where they can sit down and talk, but how do they do that if we're not teaching them to know each other? But we are teaching them about the military, and that's good. But that is not gonna work so much, I think, in a world that's becoming so diverse. And, and we are creating, rather than, I think, collaborative ways of bringing young people together, they're being brought together, I think, more in an oppositional um, way, and I really worry about that. I, I also think that we, we, we could do a great deal more you know, about things like housing, because who can really be satisfied with folks not having decent housing? You know, that's just a common human thing that, that we, you and I take for granted, except we know better. We know what's happening to people out there, you because you know, you're in the news and you see it, and, and we, were, we were not able to get some things done, I think, there that were, would be very helpful to people. And, and Jim Hendren and I had this epic failure, of <laughs> this epic failure of, of deciding that we, we thought we should lead on trying to bring us together to start having these conversations across racial lines and just figure out a way to let's not be divided by race because there's really no good reason to do that. There's nothing good that's come of that. So, so we had this proposal that was roundly <laughs> defeated <laughs> when we presented it um, and we laugh about that some now because that's all you can do but I think we're just gonna have to figure out a way to grasp for that and once again that's something I think it's so important you know we're just talking about your kids mm -hmm. and my granddaughter it's gonna be so important for them to get along because you know shooting them up and not talking to each other and living apart is not going to be the life we want them to have. It so. sounds to me like you would love to take all these ideas for a debate in the Capitol right now. You, yes. you, you, you were term limited out of office. If it yes. wasn't for term limits, yeah. would you have gone back for more? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I absolutely would have. Yeah. I would have gone, you know, on the one hand where it's, you know, I, I know because I, I have done things that I really want to do, but I also know it is very possible for us to be so much more and so much better than we are. And oftentimes, as, as I mentioned on the floor, people will say, but the kind of things you want to do though, Joyce, like you want us to, you know, not be divided by race. You want everybody to have housing. You want people to have, you know, jobs where they can make a living so they can take their families on vacation. And so many people, you know, the, oh, those are just things that we're always going to have poor people. Well, are we? Are we going to have, are we going to, do we have to continue to have poor people? Biblically speaking, uh, when it says, you know, the poor would be among us, but it doesn't say that they make minimum wage. You know, poor has other kinds of definitions. So I've always been rightly accused of having these um, ideas about wanting to do things that people think many times that are kind of impossible, but I don't think they are. Uh, and I've just never been one to accept that because something is difficult or because there's going to be a long haul, we should not do it. Uh, to me, that whole song about the impossible dream is really speaks to me because, you know, you got to be, you know, as it says, you, you, you got to be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of heavenly causes out there that I think we have not uh, grasped. And, and one of the most heavenly of all causes 
is this girl in a better future for our young people? I, I don't know how you get around that and be okay with it. Yeah. Well, let's go to, to your next <laughs> heavenly cause yeah. and your next act, which yeah. is which is Get Loud Arkansas. It's a yeah. nonprofit civic engagement group that you've started um, with a focus on voting yes. in Arkansas yes. in particular. What, what was the genesis of this idea? Well, when, when Arkansas, in, in the last cycle, Arkansas had the, the lowest voting uh, a number of people voting, the voting rate, and we had the uh, lowest number of people who were actually registered but did not vote. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so our civic engagement is 50 out of 50 states. And all those things I just talked about and wanted it to happen, I don't want it to happen just with legislators making decisions and uh, just doing it to people. I want people to actually get involved. That's why I talk about this as civic engagement because it means getting registered. Okay, great. That's just one little piece. But the next thing is you need to uh, go get educated, get mobilized, help others, and actually go vote. And the last thing, of course, is we need to make sure we're not passing laws so that people's votes don't count. That's, the, that's really important. And we are never going to be, Chris, I think as great as we can be in our state until all voices are heard and, uh, and all votes are counted. Because I have never found, and I, I have sat on the streets in downtown Little Rock and talk with people you know, who are homeless for some whatever reason, they know who I am and they always want to give me advice. So we just sit on the curb and we talk. Mm -hmm. And there's people that you walk past and you might not even see who have great ideas about things that we could do and have lived lives that are not, that their lives are not summed up as the person sitting there on the curb that I'm just sitting there talking to. And so one of the ways for those voices to be brought forward is for them to vote. And for people who say it doesn't matter, I'll just remind them just a few, uh, I don't know, a few a month or so ago, there was a race that was decided, you know, up in the Springdale area by, what, 34 votes or something like that? Yeah. And we have a sitting legislator right now. Uh, I think the votes were accounted, I don't know, three runoffs or whatever, but it came down to one vote. Mm a person who was in the military, they had sent, and there was a big ceremony almost about opening this one envelope that changed who's got to sit in that seat. And, and, it, and it, it, it does matter. And I think it, we are just so much better when we hear all those voices, including the voices of young people. Why, why do you think people aren't yeah. more involved? Why, yeah. why don't they want to be more involved? I, I, well, I'll just say, from what people say, and, and there are people who are doing research on as well, but what I hear more commonly than anything else is that, it, 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 well, it doesn't make a difference. They are going to do what they want to do anyway, mm -hmm. no matter what I say. Well, number one, you need to decide who the they are. Because if, you, if they're not going to do what you want them to do, uh, if, if you can't change their minds, you, you can get involved and change the faces. And then you have, you have a direct opportunity because you were a part of changing the faces that you, you've got to hold people accountable. and. Once people are elected, that's not the time to stop, uh, to, to just back out and not be connected with them. You have to constantly remind people what it is we signed up for because the promise of this state is too big to just leave it to 135 people. Or if it's one of the, and, and it's really important, the justice of the peace or the city board of directors or whatever the case may be, there are never going to be enough people elected that are going to realize the visions you have without there being some other folks who are involved. Because no matter how many people there are elected across this country, we have roughly now over 330 million people. The people who elected are a small number of folks compared to the ones who need to stay in touch with us. With us. And you know, kind of like you do your kids, they can still, they can now brush their own teeth and take their own showers and do whatever but you don't stop being connected with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you, and the same thing, you know, is, is, is true here. So they think it doesn't matter. That's why I started with just the numbers itself. Uh, and, and, and I think a lot of people like, like me, I didn't come from a family that was uh, uh, an engaged, uh, civically engaged family. It was just something that I got lucky with and I began to see at that young age when people believed in the folks who were running for office that they were going to make a difference. And they can't make a difference if you don't help get them there. Right. That's the thing, you know. Also, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the numbers, I think about half of the voting age population yeah. um, in Arkansas is registered to vote. So about 1.4 yes. million people. <laughs> yeah. and, and out of those, 1.4 million, about 1.2 million voted uh -huh. in 2020. So it seems that 
if you can get them voted, vote, yeah. uh, registered to vote, yeah. they're more likely to participate. So is that yeah. where, when you talk about Get Loud, that's where you're starting is with registration? Well, we're starting with registration, that's right, because the, the very first step, I'm starting there because, and I want people to know, that's just one third, you know, if you look at it in three parts. It's important to get people registered, and, and, and by the way, if you're going to vote in the upcoming primary, you need to be registered by the 24th of, let's see, when, April, April 24th. So just so people know. Uh, but get people registered. And then the second mistake we tend to make, because they're registered, they're, they're going to vote. But as you just said, many, many do not. So we have to have a relationship with people not to, to help them understand registration is one thing. And you can't just walk away and say that's it. Because if people are not used to voting, and some people even think that it's a difficult thing to do, and think, you know, and think they might be embarrassed if they go and don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So one is, if the police don't lecture people about not voting, because if they were going to vote already, they would be, and your lecture is not going to help. It's not a good thing to embarrass people by saying things like, oh, I can't believe you're not voting. Well, the numbers are right there. You can believe it. Now move on and help them do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. And that last thing is helping them get to the polls. Because people think it's really easy, for, but for many people, depending on what their lives are like, just those registered, registered voters, many of them, for example, had jobs where there was not a time they could get to the polls. Many of them have kids. They might be single parents. It's not so easy for them to just get to the polls the way people tend to think that it is. Or if we make it harder for people because we will have only one or two places in a county where they can go vote, and they might not have transportation. And, and now people are intimidated by some of the new laws we have because they think whatever register, what, I talked to a woman just today who, and I was leaving the store, and she was asking me about whether or not her uh, student ID would count because she had gone to vote um, before it did. She had gone, and, and somebody had uh, uh, told, you know, it, it, it would count. Somebody had told her that, no, you it cannot. Would. The average person would have turned around and left. And that right. happens to people. And so um, just, just learning, all of, uh, part of what we will do is edu educate people too about this is what you need to have when you go vote. This is how you do it. If you need somebody, call. We'll help you get to the polls and that kind of thing. And I want to stress, we are 5013C. We are, we, we are not nonpartisan. Into, we are nonpartisan. We are not trying to tell people how to vote anything of the kind. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just want them to be engaged because I think all voices matter. To, to do all this, it yeah. sounds like to me, <laughs> you're going to need a lot of people. Yes. You're going to need to build out infrastructure. Yes. How, how do you plan to do this through Get Loud yeah. to make an impact on a statewide basis? First of all, we have to have just, just an army of volunteers because there can never be enough money to hire everybody who's going to help out. So everybody can have some skin in this game. You can go to get, uh, um, getloudarkansas.org and find all the information about how you can sign up. Whatever skill you have, or you can input it yourself, what are you willing to do to help us get to folks? And we need this all over the state, not just in certain parts of it. And we have to hire, we physically do have to hire some of folks who are organizers. And people who don't understand how difficult or organizing is, I mean, you really need to rethink that. So we have, to, we have to have money to hire organizers. We have to have volunteers to make sure you are the person in your community or your neighborhood or whatever. People know to come to you. Somebody needs to be that person that if it's 9 o'clock at night and you're going to vote tomorrow morning, you're not sure what to do or who, you know, who to call. But more than anything, uh, it, it's a great idea for people to take some command, some control to be sure people in their areas know what to do. So. Uh, and and uh, people can make a contribution right there on Get Loud Arkansas because I, I, people sometimes, I think, like to romantically believe you just say, we're going to do it and it's going to happen, and that George Selly is going to do Get Loud Arkansas. I, 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 will, I will work my tail off, but I can't do it by myself. I've always been a collaborator, and it's going to take the collaboration of, of, of us all over the state. and. We are creating um, a civic engagement table where we're inviting groups to come to the table and let's sit together and figure out how we're going to work in this state to make sure uh, people realize the power of their vote. Because um, if we don't, you know, we could be having this conversation. I could be a great grandmother and sitting here talking with your son <laughs> about <laughs> the same kind of things, you know, in the next 15 or 20 years. So. 
Let's yeah. hope not. <laughs> yeah, let's hope not. Yeah. Um, I, I read a comment from a political science professor from the U of A who said that Arkansas for 200 years designed a system to produce low voter turnout. That's right. D you, you believe that's right? How yes, so? Yes, I absolutely. Because uh, when you, and, and that system, a lot of that system, by the way, is still in place. Mm -hmm. um, when we when we uh, when the when the Civil War was over. And we got to what Reconstruction, I think, is something we've not uh, studied in our schools. I think we should very much so, because that's when we really began to, slavery took care of itself, you know, you just didn't have. But Reconstruction was supposed to be the time we were going to all come together, and it worked for about a minute. And then that's when we started passing laws deliberately designed so that, you, you know, you could not vote. But the way it works itself out, you know, t today, for example, you, if you go, our Constitution says that if you go to prison and you serve all your time, you can't even vote until you, if you're on probation, you're no longer in prison, you're just on probation. You don't get to vote until you serve that whole probation time. I know people who will never get to vote who serve their time because they have as much as 30, 40 years of probation time. And then we, we have a system, of course, that um, just socialized people that voting is not something you do and that is still very very powerful and uh, when we were writing our constitution and and states had this power to do so we you had to go if you were white you got to vote but if you were poor and white <laughs> maybe you didn't get to vote but for people of color you know you had to take these literacy tests and tests can be something like arkansas has 75 counties name them and, and people would really learn those 75, then the next question would be name them in alphabetical order, oh. you know, those kinds of things. And today, and people think that, you know, voter ID is not the worst thing in the world, but, but here's the way it's sinister. We have passed a law in our state that requires a voter ID where there was not a problem whatsoever, but it leaves the impression we had all this fraud when we did not. And that has scared people because they'd been used to voting a certain way, and now they have to have this ID. Sometimes they think they can't get it, uh, or they think um, if, if they do get it, it's, it's, it's not going to work. If, if anybody questions them at all, uh, all these things are, are, are kind of baked in. And then, of course, you know, it was not designed for women to vote. We actually had to, we had to pass, you know, uh, we had to amend the Constitution to say that women could vote. We had to pass the 1965 Voter right in, Road Rights Act to enforce the Constitution. So it was not, it was not designed for everybody. It was designed for, a bit for us to have a low turnout, and it's worked well. You know. Having been on the inside of the yeah. process, yeah. I, I'm sure you, you saw there how hard it is to change some of these things. Oh, so yes. how much harder is it going to be for you working mm -hmm. now from the outside of the process to try to affect this change? I, I think it's... it's at this point, because of the, because of the, I think the ideology in the in the legislature, it is going to be probably not as hard to help make the change outside because my job now and everybody else who will be a part of Get Loud Arkansas, our job is to educate folks and help them understand why they should go vote and here's what it takes for you to go vote, because one of the things that th of changing a law that has been passed that makes it uh, harder for people. Uh, th those laws are just going to be in place. We have to find ways around them. And I feel much more comfortable in knowing I can figure out a way to work within this law and work around it so, so people can get access and vote than I have hope in changing that law that was put in place that was unnecessary in the, in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I, I think our hope is outside of the legislature. <laughs> You grew up in Willisville, Arkansas. A real place. <laughs> small town in Nevada County, north of uh, Magnolia. Population 148, according to the last census. Yes. What, what did Willisville teach you? <laughs> you know, such a small place that taught me big things. It's one of the places where I learned that kids are growing up thinking they don't like each other, they shouldn't be together, that it matters um, who your friends are based on your race or based on your economic circumstances. Luckily, our economic circumstances were not all that different, but I, I learned when we, I had to be a part of integrating schools in, in Willisville. And what I learned was that adults were the basis of our problems. Mm. Because it was adults who'd made these decisions 
about, I was 15. Adults had made these decisions about keeping us apart. Adults had made all these decisions that we shouldn't go to school together, that we shouldn't go to church together, uh, that some of us were more, quote unquote, entitled than others. Uh, and I learned that uh, being in the school where, I, you know, that it got better, but when that first year I was, I was not welcomed, when I was, I was told by adults who brought my transcript to my uh, attention and, said, and, and questioned where I got these good grades, because I was a good student, I worked at it. Um, but it was that little place though that more than anything else made me know I needed to and I wanted to live in all of the world. I did not want my world to be that small. I love it and I still love going there because I can feel my heart beat, my heart rate slow down when, I, when, yeah. when I'm getting to what used to be a real um, traffic light. Um, but I, I, I love geography. I love reading about places that had names that were, diff that were difficult to say that weren't like my name. And, uh, and that just taught me so much about there's so much more here than, than what's right here in this little town. And really and truly, I want to know people who don't look like me, don't sound like me, who don't speak my language. Um, and that was just kind of a, a mission for me to get out and experience the world. And, and like almost everybody else there, we were poor, we didn't have any money. But, it also, but what it did for me was, uh, you know, don't settle for this, get yourself in a position where you can go do these things, many of which I've gotten to do. But you know, I will die not having traveled as much as I want to, but don't most people. Um, but Willisville taught me to, to work at it and know this is just not it. And know that when I'm an adult, do not do this to kids. Mm. You always be the person in the room who will figure out a way for kids to do good things and the right things and work together and love each other, not uh, be taught that, oh, no, you're not supposed to talk to him. You know, don't sit next to her. And I knew that was not the way things should be done. Well, I'm sure Willisville is as proud of you today <laughs> as, as you are of it. All so. 147 of them, because <laughs> <laughs> they, they probably counted me to get to eight. <laughs> to get to 148, exactly. Yes. Well, the website, once again, is getloudarkansas.org. Yes, and we're um, on Twitter and Facebook, and you can follow us, follow us at, get, uh, at Get Loud Arkansas. Okay, so. State Senator Joyce Elliott, so great to see you once yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. Thank I you so much for the conversation. Enjoyed this conversation. It was terrific. Great to be with you. <laughs> and our thanks to you for clicking on Conversations Today. Make sure to like our videos and subscribe to the KTB YouTube page. And if there's a guest that you'd like to see on a future episode, make sure to let us know in the comments. I'm Chris May. We'll see you for our next conversation.